The following show is a Pod Avenue production. You are cordially invited to have dinner with the king. Pull up a chair and join WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler and Glenn Moore. Enjoy. Hey, King, how are you? Glenn, I'm doing great. And I'm about to be doing even better when we get some of this uh, delicious barbecue down my down my mouth here. <laughs> now, I want everybody to listening. This is the first episode of Dinner with the King. That you are in Jerry Lawler's Memphis Barbecue Company in Memphis, Tennessee, and you're invited to listen to all the wrestling stories, behind the scenes stuff from the Attitude Era, from uh, from Memphis to even now with uh, Jerry the King Lawler. So pull up a chair. And that's why we have kind of like the ambiance, the background noise that we have. Because I want you to picture like you're having a meal with the king and having some uh, some great barbecue. Yeah, and if I get any of this barbecue sauce on you, you need to have a napkin handy because I'm not a really, I'm not a, I'm not a, a real uh, neat eater when I'm when I'm diving into a slab of ribs here. But yeah, that, that's one of the things we want to do here, Glenn. And, and and for a couple of reasons, you know, there are a lot of podcasts out there. People, uh, you know, people sitting behind microphones and 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 trying to dish out all the dirt that they can on, on wrestling and everything. In, in our case, though, I just, you know, I want to make this a casual, uh, fun show in the sense that, you know, it's just going to be me and my friends uh, over a meal conversing. And, and we're going to talk about all sorts of things on these podcasts. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and the other reason that we're doing it for my new uh, Jerry Lawler's Memphis Barbecue Restaurant, which is located at 495, uh, Germantown Parkway in Cordova, Tennessee, is to give a cheap plug, just like uh, you know, like Mick Foley gives a cheap pop, and every time he's in a different town, and and uh, by mentioning the town, I want to mention the restaurant as often as I can, because uh, we, you know we're going to try to franchise these things, Glenn. We're going to try to get these uh, Jerry Lawler Memphis barbecue uh, stores all over the country, and uh, you know I can't help but think that this show might help do that. Definitely, and. You know, to set the stage, you know, Jerry and I are not actually together. You know, I'm in Cleveland and Jerry's in Memphis, but we will be recording some shows actually sitting down at one of your uh, one of your places and also your your bar and grill on Beale Street there in Memphis. So uh, the, 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 but we want you to imagine like you are sitting with us at the table and, and having a slab of ribs, but also talking wrestling with us. And that's why we're open up to having questions from you. Each every episode, we'll be answering some questions from you on Twitter and from the email. The link is at podavenue.com slash king. You can go there and submit your questions. Anything is on the table when it comes to the king and your questions. So if there's anything you want to know. Anything? Anything, you, Wait a minute. Hang on, girl. Anything? So I, I guess I promised you that before, you, before I agreed to do this, that <laughs> nothing was off limits. Anything is fair game, right? Well, to an extent, right? <laughs> no, I don't care. Doesn't matter. Ask anything. Uh, but then I'm the one that gets to decide whether I answer it or not. That's true. So, did you ever think that you'd become a podcaster, Jerry? Oh, well, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I realize that uh, every day it seems like every day, and and today is a first for me. Every day, somebody else gets their own uh, podcast, and you know, there are <laughs> a lot of great ones out there. I've done a few podcasts in the past. I I spent hours. I, I sort of got turned off on on podcasts because. I spent hours. The first one that I did was with Stone Cold Steve Austin, and I felt honored that he called me and um, you know wanted me to be on his show, only to find out later that you know these guys that have these regular podcasts have to call everybody. They ask everybody. I mean, or they run out of guests, you know. So they're just constantly asking people to be on the show. I wound up being it being on uh, Steve's podcast, doing it from here in my home uh, for about three and a half hours. And by the time we ended the conversation, I said, oh, my gosh, I'm so tired of podcasts. I'll never do another one. And it, it, and it was just, you know, it was a um, gosh, it was like I'm, I'm not going to say it was a bad experience, but it was just rehashing all the same stories that I personally have told about myself or heard about myself a million times throughout my career, you know, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't really fun to do. And I haven't done another one. Even my, my good friend, JR has asked me a million times to be on the Ross report. Uh, you know, he's got one of the most popular podcasts in the country and I've just, 
I, I've I've avoided that so far, and not anything against Jr., but just I got turned off to pot being on podcasts. And then I finally did break down because Chris Jericho was in Memphis, and he came to my house, which made it uh, a little more convenient to do. And we sat here at my kitchen table in my house, and and I did his podcast, and that seemed to go on forever too. You know, once again telling the same stories that I told that I told on with with uh, Stone Cold. So. Uh, uh, to finally get back and answer your question, no, I never thought I'd be doing my own podcast. But you and I talked about this, and we assured each other this is going to try to be a different type podcast. I told you that I'm not going to go out there and hound my friends and and beg them to be on a show with me and, and that sort of thing because I know from my own personal experience, people hate to do that. They only they only agree to be on somebody's podcast just not to hurt their feelings or something like that, you know, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to put that burden on my buddies and call them and beg them to be on a podcast. We're going to, we're going to, if, if somebody wants to be on, somebody contacts me, that's a different story, but we're going to, as I said, this is going to be probably a little different situation. We're going to talk about things that have happened through my, Ooh, 40, 46 years. Yeah. I think of like 40, 46 year career, man, when I say that number, it's just like amazing. I can't not believe it that, that I've been in this business for 46 years and, uh, you know, things and how the business has changed and, and all of the different characters that I've come in contact with and help, help along with their careers and start different wrestlers in the business. You know, I just did a show this past week, uh, up in Northeast with Northeast wrestling, my friend, uh, Michael Lombardi, runs runs some great shows uh independent type shows throughout the northeast uh, area of the country and he had a show that benefited the waterbury connecticut police department and they really went out of uh, you know above and beyond they drew a great crowd had over three thousand people on hand and he had me there he had cody rhodes there he had um oh gosh he had kurt angle there he had ryback there and he had the godfather there and he had the great Kali. he had a huge you know he had a star-studded card drew a tremendous crowd but uh and i got a chance to see some guys that i hadn't seen in a long time one of them was the godfather and you know he he called me off to the side and we're talking for a few minutes and he said he said king do you remember that i had my very first match the first match i ever had in wrestling was against you down in memphis and I, honestly, I didn't remember that. And and so then he proceeded to tell me the story that he had just signed on with Larry Sharp. Larry Sharp had a had a school up in uh, I think New York called the Monster Factory, where he started Bam Bam Bigelow and a bunch of other big guys there. And I guess the Godfather had just signed on with Larry Sharp. And I don't I don't even know if he'd make, gave him his first payment yet, but he had not even gone in and worked out. And the Godfather said Larry Sharp called him up and said, "Look, I already got a job for you." And he said, what do you mean you got a job? I can't, I've, I've not even trained to wrestle yet. He said, it's down in Memphis. You're going to be working with Jerry Lawler. And all you got to do is show up and listen to him. And I said, really? And he said, so I came down to Memphis. That's exactly what I did. I went in, came into the locker room. I told you right off the bat, I've never been in a ring before. Never had a match. And I said, you know, I said, well, that's what Larry told me. So just go in there and listen. And. Oh, and I, I did not remember that the Godfather had his first match with me in Memphis. I said, how long did you stay there? He said, oh, I was there for a long time. He said, then Mark, the Undertaker, came in and, and, and uh, teamed those two guys up, and they, they, they were there for a long time. But, you know, there there there'll be situations and stories like that that we want to talk about through this podcast and, um, and, and the 46-year-long career. A lot of things have happened to me over the years, and, and, and we'll go in depth and talk about some of those things. Uh, on these shows. Speaking of the Good Father, well, the the Godfather. Did you uh, did you get a whiff of the uh, the uh, WWE 2K17 glitch yeah. where it actually uh, you're it's one of the downloadable content and it's with the with the Godfather and you're doing a voiceover and it says, oh, you mean the Good Father? And like you must have it must have been like an outtake and they left it in the game and it and it and it, and it shows you well you, people hear you say. Oh, you want to, you want me to say it this way? Like you are recording. They they left it in. They 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 left the whole like the whole the whole line in there without editing. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy, uh, uh, Vince, not Vince McMahon, but Vince the, with 2K17 uh, or 2K Sports, the video company. He uh, 
he was such a stickler, and and then Steve Eastless was there as well, and these two guys were there to uh, record and edit Michael Cole and I during all the sessions. And man, we did so many sessions. You know, people don't people. It's it's hard to fathom how many lines you have to do uh, for for one of those video games, and you know, in a year. And I mean, thousands and thousands. I I think Michael went Michael went in. In, in, in a couple of sessions did like 40,000 separate lines and and we were in there we were in there like four times a month uh, all year long doing these doing these sessions and doing these recordings for all of those lines and it's so funny that you know the, the fans out there all they want to do is jump on one little mistake or one little outtake or something that slipped by when when you, when you are doing that many lines, we had, we had thousands of retakes. We had thousands of do-overs. Uh, any any number of things would happen that would cause us to have to re-record something, you know. So, I do blame Vince and Steve Eastless for uh, that slip up and letting that get by. That wasn't on me or Michael Cole. <laughs> I can assure you, we we weren't in charge of we weren't in charge of something like that happening. But now, wasn't there wasn't there a situation where? Uh, a lot of times, Glenn, you're going to have to help refresh my memory on some of these things because I don't think I, I think. You know, I think your brain is sort of like a cup or a glass, and once it gets full, uh, when you add any more information, a little bit of the old information kind of slips over and falls out of the out of the top. And I think that's what's happened to me. Sometimes I don't remember all of these things, but I think there was a situation with the Godfather where didn't he join that right to censor group and become the Good Father? Yeah, Jerry, he joined the uh, right to censor with that annoying theme music they had, and he had the uh, black tie, white shirt. Okay. And right. he was the uh, the good father. Yeah, well, that's um, that, you know that's that's some of the things we want to talk about. I mean, we we will, we will be able to have a whole show about uh, the my my memories of just the, just the situation we had with the right to censor. If you remember, that was with that was with um, the cat, uh, Stacy Carter. You know, one of my 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 third wife. We'll I'm sure we can have a show about wives uh, somewhere along the line too. But uh, that was when I think they had abducted her and had her part of the right to censor and. Uh, that was that was a pretty memorable uh, feud or rivalry there d- during the attitude era that we'll be able to talk about. And you know, sometimes I go back, and that's one of the things that uh, Godfather was saying at that show the other night. We we remember things in the in the attitude era uh, that we said and did, and 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 today we look at it and go, oh my gosh, how did we get away with that? How on earth? Were we able to say and do those things, and and it got by back then, you know. But it was just a whole different, it was a whole different ball game then. It was a, the the whole country was different. We've become so politically correct that um, I don't. I, I think the people would love to still see that kind of stuff, but it just certainly won't fly as far as the WWE being a you know a publicly traded company and with all the big major sponsors that they have, they have to be uh, politically correct. Yeah, King, we can do uh, two or three episodes on your girlfriends and your wives. That would be a multi-episode uh, uh, topic. Uh, let's, let me rethink that now that I hear you say that in real life. I don't, I don't know if that would be such a good idea or not. Uh, check, please. No. <laughs> <Just kidding> <laughs> social media would blow up over that, wouldn't it? Well, speaking of social media, King, you've been a little... Uh, you know, we announced the podcast on yesterday, which was Tuesday, and then right after that, people were getting sniff of what you said on Raw Talk uh, following the pay per view on Sunday, and you made a joke about uh, Nia Jax, and some people, uh, a few people on social media, uh, were tweeting at you, voicing their displeasure with a joke, and now you're not a little bit of a hot water. You're not in hot water WWE, just with a a few people on social media. Well, you know what. They need to get a life or get over it or whatever. I mean, first of all, you can't please everybody on social media. And now that with Twitter and all the social media, everybody has a voice. Everybody has got to be a way to be heard now. And anything that anybody says is going to offend somebody. And, you know, I, I, we're, we were talking about uh, uh, Sasha Banks and Bailey came on and uh, they were our guests, me and Renee Young. And 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 then um and then uh, I was talking about the fact that Sasha Banks had gotten a victory over over Nia Jax. And, and even Sasha Banks said something about, you know, I was really fortunate considering the size difference. And so, you know me. Hey, I'm, I'm a guy that uh, I like to add a little humor to, to wrestling. That's been, that's been the thing that I've been known for over the years. It's not, it's not 
brain surgery out there. It's not life or death. It's entertainment. And so any chance I get to add a, I don't care if it's an old, you know, a dad joke or whatever it is, a joke from the 80s or whatever, I'll throw a joke in there. And I was talking about the fact that Nia Jax is a big girl. I don't know any other way to say it. She's big. She's like Big Show big compared to the other uh, females on the roster. And I just said, I said, you know, Nia Jax is big. She's so big, she got hit by a car the other day, and it took three surgeons to remove it. Well, that's an old Rodney Dangerfield joke. You know, it wasn't anything meant to that was saying that she was fat. And some people came on Twitter and said, oh, King making fat jokes about Nia Jax. Well, I never said the word fat. I don't think she's fat. She is big. And if you don't think she's big, go stand next to her. Uh, and, and so people are upset saying that I was making fat jokes. Well, anybody that used the word fat, that's on them because I didn't. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, that's, that's the thing with Twitter. That's the thing with social media. You're not going to be able to please everybody. And everybody's got a way now to whine and complain if they say something that they even think uh, they, don't, they don't agree with. You know, so I just, you know, I take that with a grain of salt. And then I block them. Block. The block button's an amazing thing, Jerry. I love the block button. You know, I, my fiance Lauren, is 28 years old. And so I accuse her of being, you know, uh, glued to her phone. I say, Lauren, one of these days you're going to look up from your phone and your son's going to be graduating uh, and, and things like that, you know. And then she turns right around and says, oh, you got a lot of room to talk. You're on Twitter 24-7. And, uh, hey, uh, you know, I, I, I do enjoy... Um, Twitter's my favorite. Instagram's good. I'm just, I'm just not that, uh, I don't, I don't stay up to date on it or uh, Facebook is good too. Facebook is great in the fact that we use Facebook a lot to promote things like, uh, events that are going on at, uh, my, my bar and grill down on Beale street. We use that a lot. I use Twitter to promote things like a, like the restaurant here and, and, the, and my bar down on Beale street. Uh, but to me, Twitter is just a great Twitter's like all you need. You don't have to watch the news on TV anymore. You don't have to read the newspaper. I gave up my subscription to USA Today uh, just because I can get everything I want to know right off Twitter instantly. So, uh, no, social media is great. I don't think it really has anything to do with your age at all. As a matter of fact, I just looked and just welcomed one of my all-time favorite people. To me, uh, a guy that should be in the, in the WWE Hall of Fame, the announcer that I grew up with on uh, Memphis wrestling, Lance Russell. Lance Russell is 90 years old, and he just got on. He just got his Twitter account a couple of days ago. So I want to welcome to uh, Lance Russell to Twitter. And so I don't think that there's a. I don't think that there's any age that disqualifies you from being a part of social media. You know, I, I think it's awesome. Now, Jerry, I gotta go. I gotta back you up a little bit. Lawrence, 28. Is that a little bit too old for you? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> listen to you. <laughs> she's uh, she's awesome. <laughs> Uh, I think I think that uh, we're, we're actually engaged and and, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I, I don't even everybody knows how old I am. What the heck? I'm, I'm 67. So um, yeah. there's a there's a couple of years age difference. But you know what? We never even that never even comes into play. Uh, and when you talk, you, you talked about my age. And I think anybody out there that, uh, you know, is up in years will find one of the great things about uh, getting older is the fact that your mind does not age. I mean, you you can you can. It depends on what you want to do and what you do. You could you will still think that you're 20 years old when you're 60 years old. And I I certainly do. I mean, I still think the way I did when I was 20, and and I want to do the same things that I did when I was 20. And and I think that a big part of as long as you keep doing those things, um, it, it keeps you from it keeps you from aging. You know, there's I mean that we got softball. I have a, I've had a, a awesome softball team that I play on. Every year for the last 40, 40 plus years as well, as long as I've been wrestling, I've been doing that. And, you know, we're getting ready to crank up in a couple of weeks uh, our softball season. And some of the guys said, well, you know, aren't you too old to play softball? And I said, look, you don't quit playing softball because you get old. You get old because you quit playing. And that's the way I've looked at things all through my life as far as any kind of activities and wrestling included. You know, like I said, I, I wrestled uh, this past Friday night in Waterbury, Connecticut, uh, and, and I'm going to be. In, and it's nothing like going out there and throwing a drop kick and hearing a crowd of three or four thousand people chant, "You still got it!" You know, it's it's awesome. And and uh, you know, I've got a wrestling match coming up this coming week in uh, here in Middle Tennessee, and I I still wrestle at least four or five times a month. You know, so I think it's one of those things that if you ever stop doing it, 
then you get old. And so I, I, I've, I've not stopped and I'm, I'm going to keep on doing it. And how did we get talking about that when we started out talking about social media? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into, let's get into be, the meat. Let's, let me get a bite of one of these waffle fries. Yeah. Listen, when you come into there, you got to try the sweet potato waffle fries. They have powdered sugar on them. We serve them with a little bit of hot syrup, and, and it's just an amazing side dish. Oh, my gosh, they are so good. Whew, it's like eating a funnel cake at a fair or something like that. It's really, really great. All right, now, King, let's get into the meat portion of the show. The meat portion is we have ribs, wet or dry. You could get the cherry bomb rub, or you can get their, their <laughs> amazing barbecue sauce, or you may want the rude awakening, the smoked sausage sandwich. Well, I, I said it wrong. It's a sandwich, Glenn. So, uh, is this the meat portion you're talking about, or what? <laughs> well, back in the December, you know, the all the news sites, you know, Jerry Lawler, you know, taken off TV, released. You know, what is the future going to be? And then you sign the contract in January. I'm. It, is there ever any doubt that? Jerry the King Lawler would never, you know, be associated with WWE in some sort of way. And, you know, I, I want you to clear the air with your contract. And, you know, it, you're always going to be in WWE and, and just your status with, with the company you know, as of today. Well, yeah, this is a time to talk about that because we just talked about the fact that I'm, uh, you know, uh, how old I am and all of this sort of stuff. And, and you know, hey, the WWE is a, is a, a major corporation, publicly traded uh, a business that that is very 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 successful and they and they are successful because they you know they they stay ahead of the curve they do things they don't they're they're proactive on all sorts of things and it, one of the things that they do is they keep younger talent coming along all the time I mean, you know, that was a, that was a big thing with NXT. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, NXT was sort of uh, that was that was all the young developmental talent. And they were sort of kind of in the background and they were just, you know, bubbling under the uh, uh, scene. there, getting ready to to make it to the main roster. Then all of a sudden, boom, it, thanks to the WWE Network, NXT got a, a ton of exposure and all of these. All of these new young guys and girls started, uh, you know, making their way up to Raw and SmackDown. And it, it, and it just sort of changed for the better uh, with all of this new young talent. And it they they looked around. They said, gosh, we got a, it's like a new era. And that's basically what it was called, a new era. And so they they I swear they called me up one day and said, hey, we're going to change some things up. Um uh, not necessarily changing for the better. We're just changing to for the sake of change. We were doing with this new era. You know, first of all, they did the brand split. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I'd been on Raw for so many years. I, I, somebody, I saw a tweet the other day and said, hey, with eight more episodes, Jerry Lawler would have been on Monday Night Raw for 1,000 shows, which is amazing. I mean, you know, I, I, I've probably been on more Raws than anybody, including Vince McMahon. Um, Are you going to break that number, you think? Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> that's not up to me right. but anyway you know then then of course with the with the brand split i got moved over to uh smackdown with moral ronaldo and i was really having fun working with moral but then they came then you know then they called and said hey we're going to make some changes we're going to bring in some uh different announcers and then and and that sort of thing and so then i was moved to the pre-shows and um with booker t and with alita and scott stanford and we did a few um few weeks of the pre-shows and then uh, it was this was before the, the before uh, the end of the year last year I got a call from the you know the TV officials and, and Michael Cole was on the line and and they said well King you know we're 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 stopping the pre-shows we're not going to be doing those anymore um we're just we're just looking at something different and and you know they they don't have to explain themselves and they don't always explain themselves they just do things to like I said for for change and so they decided against continuing with the pre-shows uh, that were being shot from from Stanford Connecticut studios and they said we're not going to do those anymore so right now we don't have anything else for you and I said well okay I'll never forget Lauren and I were just about to walk we were in Orlando Florida and we were about to walk into uh, uh, Disney World, and I, I I stopped and I take this call and they said you know uh, we don't have anything anything for you right now and I said well what does that mean and they said well um, well we just <laughs> we just don't have anything for you to do and and so I mean that was their way at the time I think of of saying that I was being released 
and, and and you know it was just a it was just one of those really awkward uh, moment and i said well i'm still under contract until like january the 10th or something like that i said am i going to still get paid till then they said oh yeah yeah no problem you're, you're still under contract and you know we'll just get back with us and if you can think of something else or or whatever you know we'll talk again and so i hung up and and i you know i looked at lauren and i said wow i think i just got released and she's forgetting and i said no i'm not i i i I, I think that's what just happened. And so anyway, we went we went on into Disneyland and all of a sudden it wasn't the happiest place on earth. Um, so we we uh, we had our day and uh, then a couple of days later, um, I can't remember who it was first. But anyway, I got a, I got a call from Vince himself. And, and, and he said, King, this is not don't don't get this wrong. This is not we're not saying goodbye. We want you to be a part of the you're a part of this family and you're going to be a part of this family forever. So don't, you know, uh, there's going to be things for you to do. You may, you know, you, we still want you to, you're going to be hosting the hall of fame. We want you to do something at WrestleMania. You're probably going to be more busy than ever. So don't look at this as goodbye. And then, uh, you know, that of course made me feel better. Then, then a couple of days later, I got another call. This is all still before my contract ended. I got another call and they said, let's talk about, um, you know, doing a, just doing a new contract. And so what it, what it boiled down to was I've been there like 24 years and I had a good deal when I started. And, you know, it's just been one of those situations where almost every time my contract came up for a renewal, I got a raise. And so by this time, 24 years later, you know, I, I'm not ashamed. I, I was making a lot of money there, a lot of money. Yeah. And so, uh, it, it, it was just, I think, in their eyes, it's you know they're, they're under the gun with budgets and all of this sort of thing. And I think it just came to a point where they said, "Wow, you know, we could, for what we're paying King every year, we could probably hire three or four new announcers." And and so that's that's basically just what happened. We re, so we they call me up and they said, "Let's work out a new contract." We worked out a new contract with guaranteeing them X amount of dates per year and they guaranteed me X amount of money. And so it was an understandable situation on both ends. You know, I, I knew what it was all about. They knew what it was all about. And so we agreed on a new contract. I'm there for, uh, you know, at least another year. And I feel confident after talking with Vince and after talking with the, you know, the powers that be in, in the WWE television that I will be there as long as I want to be there. And so uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with the situation. I know that uh, as you saw, you know, they called me up uh, kind of last minute and said, hey, we want you to come and do the um, Raw Talk show. And then, of course, I'm going to be hosting the Hall of Fame show. And then I understand that they want me to call a match at WrestleMania and maybe do WrestleMania pre-show. So there's going to be a lot of stuff. And it, I, I'm afraid it's going to be like Vince said, that I'm going to be more busy than I was before when I, my contract called me to just work one day a week. Do you miss doing commentary? I mean, I know you're kind of getting back into your heel persona. Kind of like the watered down heel persona, because I know you can't say certain things now like you did back in the Attitude Era as a heel. But you know you're kind of getting back in the groove of you know being the heel commentator. Then they you know did the switch. But do you uh, do you miss doing commentary on a regular basis? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, I'll tell you when I miss it. When I watch the shows and I hear the commentary that's that's on there uh, now. Uh, then yeah, I miss it, and I and I kind of wish that I, well, I was back there doing it. You know, I don't miss I don't miss having to be on that schedule where hey, you got to be up and gone every Monday or every Tuesday and that sort of thing. It, it is kind of cool to have uh, you know more time off uh, because that that's one of the that's one of the things about this business. You know, I, I didn't get into the business to be a commentator. I got in to be a wrestler, and and of course that involved a, and entailed a lot of traveling throughout my entire career, and so the traveling has long since gotten old and and no fun so that's that's the part of that i don't miss the traveling but yeah as far as being around the guys and the, and the girls at the shows and and actually being on the show and doing the commentary yeah I, I i i do miss that that's that was fun that was enjoyable and that sort of thing but uh hey i, I like i said i think i'm gonna be doing as much or maybe more than i want to be doing in the future anyway that's good they're, they're keeping you around because, I, you know, I texted you when I read the news, like, oh, Jerry Lawler got released. And I was like, what? You know, like, I, <laughs> I was I was kind of surprised. But it's well, good. And see, that, that, that once again is part of the, you know, that's part of the behind-the-scenes people or the people that like to think 
know what is going on behind the scenes. And that was not really, you know, that was never the case. I was, I was never not under contract to the WWE. So I wasn't, I wasn't released. It was just a, a change, you know, a change in my contract, a renegotiation of the, of the contracts and that sort of thing. But that's what happens with, you know, that's what happens with social media. And especially uh, in, in this business, people love to, People love to think that they know more than they usually know about things that are going on. You got the wrestling journalists out there that think they're uh, breaking news when they're really just probably being told otherwise. Right. <laughs> it's good that you're going to be at WrestleMania, though. Um, you know, calling a match. You don't know which match you're going to be calling, right? Or you do? Or I do not. No, I do. I do not know yet. I, I just know that I said uh, hosting the Hall of Fame this year. You know. Uh, Every, everything is always changing with the WWE. And this year as well, the, the scheduling uh, has changed. It's going to be so much so much going on. Um, and I, I, was, I, I always dress when I go to the shows, I, I dress in the talent relations room. That started back a long time ago when, uh, when, when I say dress. I mean, usually just changing my shirt or something like that. But, but that started a long time ago when JR was head of talent relations. We always, you know, that was, that was basically – his his office was our dressing room while we were you know when we were raw and I've just continued to to go in there whenever I'm at a show and that's one of the things that they were talking about the other night they have the the talent relations people have booked over 1,000 appearances for WWE superstars in Orlando during WrestleMania week over a thousand separate appearances. For the for the superstars during WrestleMania week alone there, and so now Hall of Fame, which usually was on a Saturday before WrestleMania, Hall of Fame has been moved. It's going to be on a Friday night, then sa- and that's going to be at the Amway Arena. Then Saturday night, uh, they're going to have a, a, sh- a NXT show, yeah. uh, a live event. Then of course Sunday is WrestleMania. Then of course Monday is Monday Night Raw back again at the Amway Arena. At the WrestleMania is at the Citrus Bowl. Then Monday, back at the Amway Arena, is Monday Night Raw. And then Tuesday, SmackDown Live is going to be at the Amway Arena as well. So, I mean, it's just a slam-packed week of uh, WWE stuff going on in Orlando this week. And that's not even counting all the access appearances and, and, the, and the other appearances all over, all over the city. And with it being WrestleMania month or season, so to speak, Jerry, you're, we're going to be in future episodes, next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about your match with Michael Cole, a little more in depth about that. <laughs> I saw that somebody asked me about somebody sent a tweet out uh, that said um, they complimented me. I don't know something about my match with Michael Cole. And then I retweeted and then somebody somebody put on there the worst match in WrestleMania history. So, you know, it's everybody has their opinion about certain things. You know, I've watched it back a number of times. It certainly wasn't the worst match in WrestleMania history. Wasn't a great match. But what do you expect out of a guy, Michael Cole, who had never this goes back to like the Godfather. He had never been in a wrestling ring before in his life, never had a match. And so we get thrown together at WrestleMania and people expect a five star you know, uh, standing ovation. This is awesome type match. You're not going to get that out of a guy that was an announcer and who's never been in a wrestling ring before, but it wasn't the worst match in WrestleMania history either. You know? So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. And I'll, I got some, some funny, interesting stories of what all went on leading up to that match and that sort of thing. But it, it, uh, it, you know, Hey, that's, that's my WrestleMania claim to fame out of all those years in the WWE. That's my only match at WrestleMania. And we'll talk about that. That will be next week's show. And then uh, when it gets close to WrestleMania, uh, we're going to talk about some of the inductees for the Hall of Fame this year, including Rick Rude and the Rock and Roll Express, because they have some ties to you, Jerry, uh, when it comes to their uh, times in Memphis and the, and the, uh, in, the, in that era, early on in their careers, and, and even now. With I don't know them. if you want to say they have some ties to me, but I'm not going to blow my own horn or anything. But I personally, single-handedly, created the Rock and Roll Express. I put together. And you have created some other guys too. A whole list of guys you've you've uh, created, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Godfather would have to go down as one of them because he's, you know, I I had matches with Godfather and put him in the business before he had ever even been in training any anything. So yeah, the Rock and Roll Express, Rick Rude, of course, uh, uh, working down in Memphis in his early days, and he was awesome. And yeah, we'll we'll be talking about those guys, and and now they're in the Hall of Fame. That is really something. All right, Jerry. This is going to be the uh, dessert portion of the uh, 
of the show, and this will be the question and answer. And like you said, we want you guys to send your questions in to dinner with the king at podavenue.com. The link is at podavenue.com slash king. And also, you can tweet at Jerry Lawler or at our Twitter uh, account for the show, which is at dinner with, with king. And we have a question here. We're going to answer one since the show is going to be a little bit longer than uh, than usual. And t- speaking of contracts and your time in WWE, you said it's been, what, 24, year, 24 years, over 24 years, Jerry. Uh, a question from Michael. Uh, he wants to know, did WCW try to sign you before you first debuted in WWE in 92? And what made you choose WWE? Well, the short answer is no, WCW didn't uh, try to sign me before I went to WWE. Uh, and and the reason for that was that at that time, uh, we, and when I say we, I w- I'm talking about Jerry Jarrett and I still had a viable uh, company going down here in Memphis and uh, Nashville and the, throughout the Mid-South area. We were one of the few companies that survived the, the more or less uh, takeovers of the territories back in the back in the early 90s and you know we hung on down here and and the reason we were able to hang on down here is because personally i would you know jerry jarrett and i were the two owners of our company and i was like the featured talent and what happened with all of the other territories back in the day was um the featured talent you know didn't have a vested interest in staying in any particular territory so when they got offers from wcw or wwe to come and be seen on this on this worldwide stage, you know they were the first with cable TV. Um, all of the territory's major talent took off and and flew the coup, jump ship, and went with either WWE or WCW, and 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 that was the reason for the demise of most of those territories. Those companies would close up because they were not left with any feature wrestlers, and our situation was different here. We we survived and we hung on because I was the main guy. And so we could still bring in guys and 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 you know work them work them with me and and we still drew big crowds and we were able to stay in business. The thing that happened was, and I think '92, Vince McMahon finally uh, made an offer to Jerry Jarrett. Uh, he talked with Jerry Jarrett and he wanted Jerry to come up and help uh, run and help book WWE. And so Jerry accepted that. And then and and, and the deal was that we could still. Uh, you know, keep our territory down here in Tennessee viable. And the WWE would start sending or basically using our Tennessee territory company as their, um, you know, as their almost what NXT is now as their uh, area to develop uh, like a developmental area. So that's the reason Jerry first went up there. And then, of course, I then I went after that. And and it wasn't a, it wasn't a situation of a bidding war or wanting to choose to which, which ones we go went to. It was just, uh, that was the logical move to, to do and work with WWE because they decided that they would work with us rather than, uh, rather than, uh, you know, have us go out of business because, uh, the, there wasn't any talent here. They realized, and that was a very smart move by Vince McMahon at the time. They realized, Hey, you know, if there are no longer any territories left, where are we going to get new talent from? So we were able to stay in business and I worked, you know, I went up and would work uh, Monday Night Raws with WWE and then boom, I'd be right back down, still running the territory here in Memphis the rest of the the rest of the week. So that's how that came about. And and, uh, uh, you know, Jerry for a while was to was booking the booking the shows there in the WWE. That didn't that didn't last long. But, hey, I've lasted, uh, you know, I've lasted, gosh, through. uh all these 24 years and our territory, our company in Memphis uh, stayed viable until I sold it in 1996 or 1997, actually. So, you know, we, we were able to um, uh, work out a deal working together with the WWE and that's how and why I went there. Every uh, episode we'll answer some questions and this is kind of like the introductory show, Jerry, and we have so many topics to talk about. Each show is going to have its own kind of uh, topic. Uh, we're going to talk about your heart attack back in 2012. We're going to talk about Jackie Fargo. We're going to talk about the old-time Memphis, uh, the PG era versus the PG-14 era, the Attitude era. We're going to talk about Macho Man, the Hall of Fame, uh, running for mayor, your Wimp Busters, hip commentating, uh, meeting Vince. It's going to Andy Kaufman, uh, Superman, Batman. We're going to have a ton of different topics. 
uh, and we welcome your questions for each and every show. But with that, King, uh, we'll talk to you next week. And thanks for the meal, buddy. Oh, wait a minute. Who's picking up the check? Me? Got to go, King. Glenn, come on. You get it. Got to go, King. Glenn. Oh, man. Next week on Dinner with the King. There's a big story behind that, actually. That, that's why I was kind of excited about the, the uh, situation there on SmackDown Live a few weeks ago, getting to have the interaction with Dolph Ziggler. Because since the heart attack, I have been on what the WWE has uh, called a no-contact list. The preceding show is a Pod Avenue production.